With Halo Infinite releasing in 2021, there is a lot of time to speculate what's going to happen with this game. But in this video, we're going to predict the campaign, the campaign gameplay, multiplayer, and release date for Halo Infinite from all the information we currently have. So stay tuned throughout the whole video to understand all the details. Obviously, it's no secret that everyone's really excited about Halo Infinite. It's probably the most anticipated game of the year. A lot of people have been stating what they want to see in the game, but let's be honest, Halo Infinite's not going to be able to deliver everything to everyone on day one. So in this video, we're going to set proper expectations by doing some analysis of information that we already know about Halo Infinite, past experiences with 343 development games, to try and predict what Halo Infinite's going to be like when it releases. Plus, I think this would just be a fun video to revert back to like five months later and see how wrong or right I was for some of these topics, which we will cover multiple topics which are linked in the time description of this video. So without further ado, let's just jump right into the content. So first off, let's ask the question, when are we going to play this game? Not talking about the flighting process or those technical previews, I'm talking about the game release. When is that going to happen? I'm still holding true to the November 15th release date as that would mark the 20th anniversary for Halo and Xbox, so it would make a lot of sense. That is a Monday, and games traditionally release on Tuesdays or Fridays, but I think that an exception here can be made. So I'm still holding true to that release time frame, but the big differentiator, the cause that release date change would be Call of Duty. And I believe Call of Duty is a big reason why we do not have a release date set for Halo Infinite. Bill Spencer said in a recent podcast they have it down to a three to four week period. My assumption that period being within the month of November, most likely after the release of Battlefield 2042, which is in October 22nd, and sometime before November 26th of Black Friday in the US. So sometime between there, that's when we'll see the release of Halo Infinite. Next, let's talk about the campaign. We're gonna be talking this in three different sections, the campaign as a whole, the campaign gameplay, and the story behind it. What kind of elements are we gonna see? Personally, I think the length of this campaign is gonna be pretty average to your typical Halo experience, about six to eight hours for a total game time. Of course, we do have side missions which could add the padding to up to maybe 10 hours or something like that. It kind of depends on how thorough of a player you are with Halo Infinite. Since Halo Infinite is going to be an open and expansive world, there is a lot of things you can do besides just playing missions, it seems like. And I've seen reports of people saying it's going to be like a 20, 30 hour campaign. I mean, possibly if you just want to do mess around a whole lot and just kind of play at your own leisure. Are you sure something like that could happen? But I think for your main storyline, gameplay length, probably six hours to eight hours. If you really want to pat it out, you can probably make it a 10. Now, how about the gameplay? How is this campaign going to play out? What are the nuts and bolts to make this campaign a fun experience? Well, I think the general structure, which has been pretty much confirmed, is going to be that we're going to have these mainline story beats, but there's going to be side missions along the way that if you want to, you can interact with those. This image of Halo Infinite's tack map does a really great job of showcasing what to expect. So what I'm seeing here, or like these gun battery sections that we saw within the 2020 reveal, these will be like your main story beats. But then on the other side, we're gonna see these spires, which we'll get to a little bit later in this video. You also have an icon for towers. You have an icon for these bases, which I will get into a little bit later as well. You have things like high value targets, it seems like as well. You have some other icons at the top. So all this combining equaling to some form of mission structure that we'll have for Halo Infinite. So side missions, like I mentioned earlier about high value targets, they'll probably see like a defend kind of thing, probably a saving kind of mission because it did mention about saving Marines on the side of a mountain. So we'll see that when it comes to side missions. We could have high value targets like Jager Redumni, Hyperius, and Tavares, which were mentioned in Cannon Fodders, being kind of like mini boss battles, possibly providing some new elements of the gameplay you can unlock by taking down these big bad guys. These bases that you see over here are going to be ways where you can actually edit your loadouts within Halo Infinite's campaign. We saw this within the 2021 campaign reveal, actually. Within this shot right here, you can see that this is most likely what we're going to be seeing for these bases that we're going to have within Halo Infinite. You have these green towers indicating a friendly location. Looks like you have a spot over here on the right where you can edit your loadouts for like weapons, grenades, equipment, and things like that. And also a place where you can possibly spawn a vehicle as well so you can traverse the world of Zeta Halo in an effective way. 
Now I mentioned this earlier of it being an open and expansive world. This means that it's not going to be open world. 343 has been very specific on their verbiage when it comes to this. They've never said open world. They said open and expansive world. And they've talked about this in previous development updates stating that how you play through the game, you'll unlock new areas, but you'll be able to backtrack however you like. Which sounds very familiar to the way ODST's campaign played out where we started out on new Mombasa streets in a very small area. But as you progress through the game, it opens up more areas of the map for you to unlock and do more things. Now we've seen these small towers throughout various concept pieces of art for Halo Infinite. I believe these small towers probably act as some way to unlock new areas of the map. Because if you refer back to this image, you can see on the far left side, it shows the tower, but then also it's locked away. Now, the tower could be much more specific than a tower, and possibly you need to hit some of these main story beats for it to make sense to open up the next area of the map. That certainly could be the case, or it could be like an Assassin's Creed kind of thing, where once you go over to this area, press a button of some sorts, and it opens up a new section of the map. Now, there is going to be a day-night cycle when it comes to Halo Infinite, and I do believe we're going to see some different kind of experiences between day and night gameplay. One reason is because in a recent canon fodder, Grim Brother 1 stated that Jagger Odumni would be a character that's kind of lurking in the shadows. When do shadows mainly happen? At night. A 343 developer within a recent S343 did state that gameplay elements will change compared to day and nighttime as well. So could nighttime be a much more dangerous experience compared to daytime? Possibly, or maybe just different. Could nighttime bring out the silent shadow of super lethal elites, which could be almost kind of a bit of a horror game aspect to the whole thing? It's up to 343 to see how they play it out. It could be either be more difficult or just different. Now let's talk about the story when it comes to the campaign of Halo Infinite. This part is actually one of the things I'm most excited about for the game itself. Because Halo Infinite's launch campaign is essentially going to set the tone for the next 10 years moving forward, so it's going to be a very important story to tell. First character I want to talk about is The Weapon, also known as Cortana 2 or Cortuna. It's going to be very interesting to see what this new Cortana model has to do with the story of Halo Infinite. Obviously, we do know that she infiltrated Zeta Halo, extracted the original Cortana to, for deletion, but somehow she didn't get deleted. I do expect us to actually spend most of our time with the weapon rather than real Cortana. I could see at the end of Halo Infinite's original story that maybe with real Cortana you have a pull the plug kind of moment where it's up to Chief to actually kill Cortana. Because honestly, it's going to be a bit confusing having the weapon and Cortana at the same time. Either the weapon can somehow integrate into original Cortana to make her good again, or you have to transfer the knowledge of evil Cortana into the weapon, or some kind of space magic needs to happen there to create one Cortana model. I have a feeling that the E3 2021 campaign moments that we saw with Chief and the weapon either lead us into the second or third act of the game. Next is a character that we've never seen within the Halo story, but I think is super important, is Mendicant Bias. If you guys all know who Mendicant Bias is, he's an important, imp very important character within the external lore of Halo. It was basically the Forerunner's version of Cortana, but then he got infected with the Logic Plague and actually had the Mendicant Bias, the most powerful AI ever created, fighting for the Flood. And there is like his terminal console station thing that's on Zeta Halo where Mendicant Bias could possibly be. Plus, we saw these three red dots within the E3 2020 campaign trailer, which screams Mendicant Bias to me. Maybe it's an inactive sleeping mode version of Mendicant Bias that's there or something. It just seems super spooky and too reminiscent of Mendicant Bias to not have him in the game. And possibly Mendicant Bias could provide us knowledge for the UNSC to learn from the Forerunner mistakes as there is a lot of similarities in history repeating itself with Cortana being like Mendicant Bias. Next, I want to talk about one of the most important parts that I would expect to see come back in Halo Infinite, and that is the Flood. With Halo Infinite being a spiritual reboot, I feel like it's calling back to the original trilogy, right? What was the main story driving villain and faction behind the original trilogy? It was the Flood. We've seen hints of the Flood returning within various toy reveals, and 343 did find a way to write the Flood back into the game during Halo Wars 2, so I would be shocked if the Flood do not return in Halo Infinite, but I don't think we're going to know that at all until we actually play the game. Because I would love to experience that similar kind of feeling of when you first come across the Flood in Combat Evolved, but this time in High Fidelity, 
with Halo Infinite. And since we're on Zeta Halo, talking about the Flood returning, we gotta talk about the Palace of Pain. The Palace of Pain is a Forerunner research facility where the Forerunners tested the Flood on ancient humans. And those ancient humans refer to that research facility as the Palace of Pain, which is on Zeta Halo and also seen the 2018 reveal trailer of those glyphs that were written into the wall, screams ancient humans in that big huge building in the background of the cover art that we don't know about yet. I just strongly feel that's the Palace of Pain. It's gonna be a very important part to the story of Halo Infinite. But how do I think the story is going to end? Well, I think ultimately you face off one-on-one -on -one with Ashram in a final boss battle, I'd say very similar to Tartarus. Obviously with you being Master Chief and that guy being Ashram being the bad guy, you take on Ashram, you kick his butt and make him regret everything he ever did in his life. And that's the end of the game, but there's a cliffhanger. I'd say for like an end of credits kind of thing or an epilogue kind of thing, like we saw with Halo 4, I would expect to see Atriox return at the end to create a cliffhanger to make you want to wait until the next campaign drop expansion that we'll have for Halo Infinite. Because Atriox is still out there doing his thing, but if you have a lot of buzz, a lot of explosions and nonsense going on with Zeta Halo, Atrox is going to want to come by and check it out going, what the heck's going on here? Especially if you kill Ashram, who is Atrox's like right hand man, that's going to definitely be something to bring Atrox into Halo Infinite's story. So let's talk about multiplayer now. Multiplayer is going to function very differently than we've ever had with Halo before. Traditionally, Halo's multiplayer has just been something separate apart from the campaign, where you just play 10 to 12 minute long matches on repeat on an infinite amount of times because it's fun. But I think this time around, we're going to see some story elements tied to the multiplayer experience of Halo Infinite. In a way, these events that we're going to be having within Halo Infinite's multiplayer experience are going to be like these little story events that are going to be ways to kind of connect the gaps between these major campaign beats that we're going to get probably every two years or so. We've seen this done with Apex Legends, Call of Duty Warzone, and Fortnite as well as basically that these different kind of story elements provide this narrative style of multiplayer storytelling provides different context to content updates and changes. Essentially what I'm expecting is going to be like the spirit of Spartan Ops, which was going to be like continuous story content throughout Halo 4. The story for Spartan Ops was great, gameplay not so much. Basically I'm expecting to see like Spartan Ops quality storytelling within these events of Halo Infinite. So we do know that season one of Halo Infinite is gonna be very Reach influenced with Heroes of Reach. This makes me feel like either it's gonna be like alongside the story of the campaign or fill in the gaps between these campaign beats or say like the UNSC needs to go back to Reach for some reason. Hence why we're getting so much customization from Reach. Hence why we're seeing so many Reach weapons and toys and things like that with Halo Infinite. I'm sure a big thing people are going to be very curious about are what modes are going to come out with Halo Infinite's launch. Now I don't think it's going to be like bare bones like Halo 5's was, but I think what Halo Infinite's going to do at launch is provide the necessities that you need for a good Halo launch. So things like Slayer, CTF, Oddball, Fiesta, BTB, Ranked Modes, and things like that, along with like weekly and seasonal playlist updates are going to be in rotation there. So I think that's kind of what you're going to expect. Uh, for you more niche modes like Infection, SWAT, Snipers, and Doubles, and things like that, you might have to go play custom games for that. But that kind of leads me into my next point, talking that I do expect to see a custom game browser with Halo Infinite, mainly because we've had it in Halo 5, we've had it in MCC, why wouldn't we have a custom game browser within Halo Infinite? Having a custom game browser will provide an outlet for these players who are much more niche when it comes to the Halo experience to be able to play Halo how they like to play it without having to try so hard to find a community to do it with. Though I'm sure one concern is that like, okay, well, isn't this gonna cut me off from like progressing through the game or any XP? Brings me into my next point there, talking about XP and progression for multiplayer. If you're playing Halo Infinite, you're going to be earning something. I think that no matter what you'll be playing, you'll be earning XP and battle pass progression. That's either in matchmaking, Cusa games, Forge, campaign, whatever you're doing. If you're spending time playing Halo Infinite, you're going to be making progress on something for your unlocks or XP gains. Obviously, payouts might be a little different based on what you're playing, or could just be completely time-based. Either way, progression is gonna work totally different than we've ever seen in a Halo game before, because I really do feel like that 343 is gonna be very player-focused when it comes to this kind of experience, so then people are continually working their way through the battle pass, unlocking new things, no matter what they're doing within Halo. 
Talking about unlocks and battle passes, that obviously involves customization. Now we've had a pretty good impression after the multiplayer overview what customization is going to look like in Halo Infinite, which is essentially like Halo Reach level customization, which I'm all for that and a little bit more on top of it. I honestly think that the coding system is going to provide a good amount of options for players to pick the coloring and material style that they want for their Spartan. I also feel like the community's opinion on armor coatings has completely changed after what we saw for the multiplayer reveal of Halo Infinite. This is a tweet I put out comparing two different polls asking the same question about the armor coding system. This one down below was asked a few weeks before the multiplayer reveal asking, do you think you like like it or dislike the coding system, only 55% said they liked the system, 45% said no, with 5.5 votes. And then a few days after the multiplayer reveal, I asked the same question, do you think the armor coding system for vehicles and weapons and everything works? 84% said they liked it, but that's about 5.9 votes. So about the same amount of people, same sample of, of an audience, and yet the opinion of coatings has completely flipped since then. And we also have armor cores as well, which are going to be a way to kind of give you like a set of armor that you want within Halo Infinite. So for example, the Halo Infinite style armor that you've been seeing all around the whole time, it's been the Mark VII Olympus armor set. But we do know with the Heroes of Reach season one content, that Mark V Reach armor set is gonna be available as well. And then we also have the event of the Yoroi Samurai armor set that's gonna be a part of the whole thing as well. This could allow for multi-generational armor sets to be part of Halo Infinite's customization over the seasons to come. And a really important feature to create a lot of replayability is challenges. We do know those are coming back as well, as they were confirmed within a Butterfinger promotion about challenge swaps being available to be earned within these Butterfinger promotions. So what I'm expecting to see, they probably have like a list of like your five challenges to do for the day. But if you have some challenge swaps, you can swap out various challenges to kind of randomize some new option that you would like to have instead. Very similar that we have for Apex Legends and their challenge system. Now let's talk about one of the biggest mysteries with Halo Infinite that we know it's going to be part of it, we just haven't seen anything of it, and that is Forge. I believe Forge is going to be bigger and better than we've ever experienced before. We do know that there's going to be an undo and redo button option, which is going to be huge for Forgers out there. They've been crying for this option for such a long time. One thing I do really expect to see that we has not been confirmed at all, but I do expect to see it happen, is AI within Forge. I think it'd be so cool to see these Forges create like their fan-created campaign missions, much like we've seen with Far Cry 5 back when that released. And if that game could do it, why not Halo Infinite? I do also expect to see a bit of a terrain editor as well, rather than having these set blocky pieces you have to kind of angle properly to make it like a hill. I think it'll just have an option to just kind of pull the ground up to make a hill that you would like. And obviously, depending on the quality of Forge content, we could see Forge being a big dependence on new content for Halo Infinite as well. Or 343 could leverage Forge creations in between these big seasonal beats. And another feature that I do expect to see have come back, but I really hope it does a better job of it, it's theater mode. Now I do hope it does actually function way better than Halo 5, I do expect it to do so, but one question I know that's been kind of concerning for a lot of people is will there be campaign theater? 343 has never made a game with campaign theater. I, God, I hope there is, because there's so many amazing moments that happen within campaign. It's going to be so beautiful and so scenic that you're going to want to like take some awesome screenshots. You're going to want to record some awesome clips and some awesome moments that you can't just leave it up to like the Xbox software or external PC software to capture these awesome moments. So I'm crossing my fingers for our campaign theater. I'm just not betting on it right now. I also would really like to see a photo mode within theater as well, as obviously customization is gonna be a huge driver when it comes to monetization. And one way to show off your Spartan and be able to you know, share it on Twitter, or on Facebook and things like that, is to have a photo mode to make some really awesome screenshots for your Spartan to make your guys look completely badass. And lastly guys, let's talk about the business side of things, the microtransactions within Halo Infinite. At the moment, we know right now that there is a two track system when it comes to the battle pass there's a free version and then there's going to be a paid version as well my expectations with the paid version you'll probably get more things like double xp tokens maybe some more in-game currency to buy stuff within the marketplace and just extra little goodies for rewarding players for paying money into the battle pass system but i do expect to see like major content unlocks like armor sets new weapons and things like that if they all that gets put into the battle pass 
I'd expect that to be both free and paid at the same time, but if you really care about additional customization, if you really care about ranking up your character a lot higher than most other players, paid battle passes might be the way to go. And like I said earlier about the marketplace, I do expect to see like a real money store in addition along with the battle pass as well. We've seen this a lot with pretty much every other free-to-play shooter out there. Though I do expect to have the ability to unlock in-game currency that you can utilize within the store from just playing the game. So say if you grind your way up to the 100th tier of the battle pass for free, you probably earn some kind of currency along the way where you could probably afford to buy like one thing from the store from your time played within the game. Talking about grinding your way up to tier 100 within the battle pass, How's that going to look like? 343 has stated that they don't want Halo Infinite to play like a grind machine and just have to constantly keep on playing just to unlock everything. And with Halo Infinite kind of coming up as like an underdog kind of situation within the first person shooter genre right now, they need to be a little more lenient on allowing people to unlock things within the game. So I, I fully expect dedicated Halo players that, that play like two or three times a week, put about five to 10-ish hours in a week, would most likely be able to finish a battle pass within the three months time each season is going to be. As I, I feel like that's a fair way to reward players who keep returning back to your game, but also cause a bit of incentive to kind of lightly grind your way up to tier 100. What are your thoughts on these predictions? Let me know in the comment section down below. Do you have your own? Let me know in the comments. So thank you so much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. I'll catch you on the next video. Peace out.